All right. Um, I'm honored to be here at CCA. I'm alumni from 2010, graduate design. And um, at first I was excited to speak in person, um, but you know, it's a global pandemic. And so we're still on Zoom and that's actually perfect for my work because I'm focusing on what we're missing with our technology right now. Um, Let's see, Marshall McLuhan in 1964, he's a media theorist, said, all media is extension of some human faculty, psychic or physical. Um, but also in the medium is the message. It really, the content can be the same, but the context changes how it's delivered. So for instance, a lot of my work is in wearables and that changes your intimate connection with the technology compared to perhaps seeing something on video. It could be the same content, but your experience is much different. Let's see. Uh -oh. Okay, got it. <laughs> um, and he, he coined this phrase, age of anxiety, with um, how hard it is to assimilate technology. And that was 1964. Now we're in the year 2020 and the World Health Organization states, one in 13 globally suffers from anxiety, one in five in America. Um, it's the most common mental disorder worldwide. And anxiety is defined as a reaction to stress. It's not being able to assimilate with your nervous system, all these cues um, like emotional regulation. So perhaps it's time to turn media to focus on our bodies and our well being. Um, also, the World Health Organization recently suggested to scale down our media intake because that produces anxiety, but we need to find new social connections um, so we can augment our multi sensory, nonverbal, social, and sensory cues to provide essential connection for well being at a distance. And that's our goal. Oops, there we go. <laughs> With extimacy. Um, so this is my concept. It's called, it's basically externalized intimacy, showing how you feel on the inside to the external world. Um, and how I do that is with biosensors. I call it therapeutic biomedia. Biosensors that read how you're feeling and then translate that data in real time to visual, auditory, or tactile displays. And embedded in clothing, it gives the wearer instant biofeedback, how they're feeling to keep them real time. And then it also acts as a teledisplay to tell other people how you're feeling. So this nonverbal communication that's almost intuitive and psychic. Um, here's just a palette of different sensors that are available right now to monitor your body. I'm more interested in the Interception, the internal um, sensors like heart rate, uh, brain waves, um, excitement levels. And what Extimacy brings us, it's a fusion of three areas. We have your biofeedback that's made expressive to give you a biofeedback loop um, that creates awareness technology, but also embedded in the clothing, dynamic empathy, and also emotional durability because you create a relationship with the clothing because it's it's talking to you. Um, so I'm very uh, inspired by Robert Hooke, who in, nine, in 1665 developed lenses for eyeglasses and also microscopes. Um, it was a nascent time of eyeglasses and he, he suggests if we're augmenting for vision, why not smell, touch, taste? And also sensory substitution, which was also in the 1960s, um, based on synesthesia, which is cross-sensing in your brain. So uh, one in 25,000 humans actually are predisposed to this condition where um, perhaps you can hear movement or see emotions as colors. Um, so some people already have this, but 
it can be learned with um my theory is the sensory prosthetics we and the neural plasticity of your brain you can learn these abilities uh, so we'll start with some work um so this is me i'm kristen leidlinger i was in CCA for uh, future speculation of healthcare was my thesis in 2010. Um, and I created designs for people with sensory processing disorders, so condition from ADHD to autism to help them regulate in the world, express how they're feeling and read other people. And uh, here's a future idea that I created based on having uh, sensors that would be located in the adrenal glands. So it's your kidneys and it's your flight and fight response or freeze or fawn. It's um, when you get really nervous, what are you gonna do? And so I'm animating what your body naturally does, which is animals normally puff up. Um, so I created this inflatable to puff up, make you look larger, but also give you a little compression, which calms your nervous system. So you can actually focus on the task at hand and you get tunnel vision your eyes close in so you can also focus on what's happening and make the best choices. Um, and here's another in the CCA studio. It's fun digging up these old photos. Uh, this was a pivotal moment in my design voice is uh, I was creating instant meditation and I created this pod that you could lower down on yourself if you were sitting in the meditation pose. Um, and then there I am in my studio, roped it, roped it up above my head so I could go in my silent cone. Um, and it also had binaural beats. So these are sound waves that entrain your brain to the meditative state, which is the theta state. And, um, but at this moment, one of my professors said, this is architecture. Like if it's designed, bring it closer to your body. Um, and it could be simpler simpler form and it turned into this. So instant meditation became on the eyes and also like, what does med meditation feel like? Um, what does it look like? And to me, it was this white fuzzy material that you get lost in that's really comfortable. And this still had the binaural beat headphone. And what this did was put you in instant meditation so you could heighten your other senses, like your taste and touch. Um, truly really enliven your experience. Um, another early uh, prototype was um, monitoring how our posture is in a chair. Uh, I came from a physical therapy background and um, came back to grad school. And this was the most common problem is there is no comfortable chair. And, uh, but again, another professor said, do we really need another chair? <laughs> no, we need awareness of our body in space. So uh, I did some self studies, audio, auto ethnographic studies of where does a slouch start? Like, how do we notice where we are in space? Um, and then I mapped the spine. So the head was black dot and the tailbone was the white dot. Oops. And here it is in the chair and we see the apex. I, I mapped where the actual movement was um, starting from. And then from there, I found a theory that matched my findings. Um, it's called the posture theory diagram here. And it also says it's in the sternum. That's where the angle of compression starts and that um, puts pressure on your organs, on your diaphragm, so you're not breathing well, and your low back. So my design, my final design was to create the slouch screamer. So this was uh, my first expose with Arduino microcontrollers and bi body sensors, so exciting. So I had a flex sensor in the sternum, and when you slouched, it went eh. So it was the, the sound of pain, I thought. Um, it's also a little funny for your neighbor. Um, and then the next design I'm showing 
was also started at CCA and it's taken me throughout my career. I'm still doing work on this one today. Um, it's the Galvanic Extimacy Responder, the GER. And this was out of a lot of studies I did, um, user studies. And what this is, is a galvanic skin response sensor. So that's arousal, it's humidity. The sensor is located on the hands and it reads your excitement levels. And then I translated that to blue, calm, or red, excited. Um, it's the same technology that's in the lie detector test. So it's, it's very fun to see how you're feeling. Um, and then that progressed further. Uh, a couple of years later, I was invited to show, sh exhibit it in a, in a show. And I think that exhibited for eight years, which is great. Um, so we made the next version, next iteration, and we added more colors. So here we have uh, the green is tranquil, then uh, blue is kind of sad, introspective. Pink is ruffled, excited. Red is nervous, in love. And then we added a white, a mixture of all the colors, which is ecstatic, blissful. Um, and same idea, the bowl-shaped collar is for the self-awareness, being able to reflect on yourself, but also project out to other people. Um, and we've continued to do research with this in the easier design here. You can see it's just a collar. And here we are in Dubai with a, doing some research with VR. Can we incorporate biosensing with VR? This was a couple of years ago. Uh, now the picture, I said, is it blind water? Yes. Yes. Blank? Yes. Yeah, Down. Yeah, keep, keep working. And um, with VR, there's often somebody that has to take care. <laughs> yeah, it's feasible. It's okay, so, so keep, keep coming. Of the client. Uh, and the, the caregiver said that this helped oh. him. Come straight be able to read how she's feeling. <laughs> and also when she almost fell over, they had a little extra quick <laughs> warning signal. Um, <laughs> and now I'll show another video. Um, this is another design I really liked, a good process of um, being able to create this monument piece um, for a commission and then to keep it going into practice. So this was the Neurotique, it's a brain animating mind mapping design. It's commissioned by a 3D print uh, company. Um, and I tried to work, it was back when 3D prints, I think it's 2014. We're very stiff. And uh, we had the four machine, which had resin. So I was like, how do we make this wearable? And uh, we ended up knitting monofilament, which is like fiber optics, and then embedding the, um, the globules. They're called, actually, I collaborated with a professor from CCA, Jason Kelly Johnson, to create these globules. And, um, and then again, we did extimacy of translating the brain states into a palette of colors. And we worked with headsets and each sensor point we mapped to a color. And um, then we create, we're invited to create a spa, like an experience by a big pharma company. So this was very fun to work with um, scientists and actually create data like report cards for people, they have a whole experience. And here's a video to show the transgression, where it starts as an idea, the, you see the 14 points of her brain set, the mode of epoch translating into colors. Thank you. 
So this was a very fun experience to, to collaborate with a mindfulness doctor, a neuroengineer, and a meditation teacher to create this experience. And they were led through a class and then we got to see their brain states change in real time. fun expose um, and then we'll move on to goosebumps um, I've had a, a long run of goosebumps I designed a goosebumps biomedia inflatable 2015 um, this was in the Netherlands and created an inflatable kirigami design so kirigami is uh, cut paper cut fabric and then as it inflatables as the wearer would get excited would inflate and then open the kirigami to show you the colors and our palette is here of inhale exhale and then when they got excited it would inflate with the goosebumps frequency it would be pink um, here's the final design I'll show you that as the intro and then uh, later the next design was we made a partner so Inspired by that phrase that gave me goosebumps, did you feel it too? Created a partner duet. So one person feels the goosebumps and then transfers it to the next design. Um, and we did a lot of research here where people feel goosebumps and the different kinds and what colors. So really crowdsourced information. And then worked with sensing. We had a uh, different biosensors for this one. We had GSR breath and heart rate variability. Um, and it started off very clunky as you see here and then it continued and got very excited about audio tactile fabric. So goosebumps frequency is 40 Hertz. So if you have the um, speaker on your skin, it'll actually raise your skin, your hair. To give you goosebumps so we're like oh okay that's perfect we'll make some speaker fabric so here it is um, through many iterations that would subtly vibrate to tickle your skin and then also material process of how do we animate these characteristics um, created this 3d print fabric that would move uh, would inflate again we'd have the inflatable underneath and it would open and expand so you have a little video here and the inflatables underneath and here's incorporated with the inflatable I always love adding light for a little multi sensory. Good. Um, so here's the diagram how it all works, how they're connected, sharing the goosebumps. And let me show you a video. interesting now because it can be shared Wi-Fi, Bluetooth um, across the globe. 
turn more into a flexible exoskeleton for therapeutic use. So we've create, created remote touch. Um, see, here it is. And I have a video I'll show of this. Um, we worked with acupuncturist, acupressure doctor to find the correct pressure for pneumatic touch. Um, and we mapped acupressure points are actually good for autism, but just general well-being on this vest. And the difference with this is it inflates inward, so you don't see it inflate, but you can feel it. for therapist-client relationship, but it could be a remote setting again. Help design like a home therapy, but you could also take it with you. You could wear the vest. Here we show the acupressure points. Flexo offers remote healing touch. Eliminates breathing. Monitors mood. Provides acupressure point inflatables to align body mind. Flexo, flexible exoskeleton for therapeutic touch. very excited that we've been doing some real life studies. Um, I'm currently a PhD candidate in the Netherlands uh, and I've been working on these studies. Um, the first one is a snozzelin. It's a multi-sensory room. That's a Dutch invention. It's um, where you go to calm, relax yourself. And, um, but of course I wanted to make it wearable. And we got a nice grant to work with uh, disabled adults um, in the Netherlands and test out all the basic components that I've been developing over the years. And um, we had some good results. I will show a video. Um, yeah, we worked with PIMD, it's profoundly, profound intellectual multiple disability adults. And got to try the extimacy to see if it could give the body a voice. Um, so a lot of these adults were nonverbal. And we found that it, it helped the caregivers monitor the client. But even when the caregivers wore the design to help the client understand them better. And then we used the touch robot, the Flexo as a hand form to see if that could be remote touch of their caregiver, maybe to calm them down. Yeah. The, the 
parents would say the only thing that would calm them down if they were having perhaps a seizure would be like a, a hand touching. So we're like, oh, what if we make it this inflatable hand that we could correlate to their hand? So that was first step of this study. Um, and thanks to the University of Twinton, and to Parabol. And, um, and then for my final expose, I've been working um, with space. I think space travel is fascinating and the future. So I was very excited to be um, accepted by the European Space Agency to test extimacy with um, a group of analog astronauts. And this is in Hawaii. Um, and I got to be on the simulation with a group of six um, astronaut candidates testing extimacy. And we used the mood technology. And here's a, a video. Um, here's the, the base camp. We're there for 15 days. Um, and tested the mood collar designs for uh, self-awareness and teamwork. And the biggest problem with space travel is the isolation. So we we're wondering if we could create more of a sense of community and connection. Again, they could help um, predict behaviors before someone would have, would have to verbalize something was wrong or um, if they were out of sorts. So uh, I made it through everything. That's my talk for today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and I, I would love if, if there are any questions or comments or ideas. Um, also emailing later is awesome. So thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Oh, can, can you see us? <laughs> I can see you now. Okay. okay. We can't see we ourselves. We can't see ourselves. Yeah. So. Oh. Thank you, Kristen. That was wonderful. So we have a myriad of ways people can ask questions. If you're online, you can pop your questions into the Q&A or the chat. And we have a live audience here. So if you're in the audience, feel free to um, come up to the speaker or just shout out your question. Does anyone live have any questions? If not, we'll go to the Q&A. All right. So our first question is, have you ever thought about the relationship your wearables in the context of consent? Um, yes, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I think they would be very valuable there too um, for self-awareness, but also cueing other people like this is not okay with me or um, in general, I find often people don't really know how they feel, which is interesting. So I think any kind of input is very helpful. Yeah, that seems like a really interesting area to explore. Um, it divergent from the last one. What are, that's okay. <laughs> what are the immediate implications for the metaverse? I think was the question. Got it. There we go, sorry about that. What are some immediate ramifications for the metaverse? Um, well, this 
could definitely connect to anything. Um, <laughs> so your avatar, uh, we, we actually have a, an avatar with the, the mood tech I didn't show, but um, yeah, your avatar, we could show your mood in your avatar. And um, I think that would be really interesting because then the avatars could have more awareness of each other. Or, um, ramifications, it could, I guess to me that's, do you want to show this information or not? This, <laughs> um, but I think it could really enhance our whole online experience in the metaverse. Like um, there's even potential biosensors that could run off of your body you know, you could um, use the energy of your body to feel them, which would be interesting. One more question in the chat. Oh. Can most of those technology? Can most of those technologies you show in your presentation be able to detect the emotion of jealousy? Huh. Well, jealousy is a complicated emotion. Um, <laughs> and right now we're we're really re reading like arousal level like how excited you are um so you could be excited and jealous so it's a there's still some more tweaking to really identify the complex emotions but we can tell more basic ones like are you calm? But that's definitely in the future. I'm excited to run more studies about that. Mm -hmm. We just have questions yeah. flying in here. Go ahead, you um, can read them. <laughs> inspiring work. I'm also taking a course in 3D printing. Would you mind sharing how you collect inspiration of form and structure of design? Um, yeah, I'm really inspired by the body systems. I definitely look at that, uh, like the, the goosebump design. I looked at the skin and um, the skin patterns and um, I get a lot of inspirations, a lot of mood boarding, like even a cracked river bottom, like how how do we make this organic, but also use technology? Um, I think it's a, it's a fun puzzle to <laughs> put those two together. And there's always some exciting aha moments. How do you choose which emotions to display? And is it based on the current technology we have available? Yes, there, there are some limitations with technology, of course, um, but it is expanding exponentially. But that technology is getting smarter and smaller. Um, but I focus on positive psychology with the emotions I choose to display um, to encourage people to participate because uh, often, well, in the past, people get very nervous to show how they're feeling. Even if it is red, they think they're showing a lot to the world. So um, try to encourage with positive psychology of that this is constructive and um, fun <laughs> and positive for the community. Um, but yeah, I also work on the, the basic six emotions from uh, literature and studies, and then building on those to make more complex emotions is the structure. I think it's really interesting that your background was in physical therapy. Did you kind of always anticipate that wherever you went in design, it would build on that? Or was that kind of a happy accident? kind of a 
happy accident. I really thought I might make um, a prop like for people to sit um, and then thank goodness for microcontrollers and <laughs> biosensors. I was like, oh, I can make my own biodetection devices. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I'm really inspired by the body and I was also a dancer. So I grew up with all this available to me. And then I realized, oh, a lot of people don't have this uh, uh, language, this body language. And um, I think it's very rich, this awareness. And I do think, I guess I left the physical therapy because I was like, okay, I'm teaching people to breathe and breathe and breathe. There needs to be tools so you can help more people at the same time. Um, I think that's wonderful. I think it's so common that we, people come to design school and they are just like, I have to forget who I was before, but you know, it, their passion comes out in these little ways. And it's just in hindsight, it's fascinating that yours ended up where it did. Um, so it seems like you collaborate with many different people, from practitioners, institutions. Can you talk a little bit about your process for finding and choosing collaborators? Um, yeah, I love collaborating. I often uh, I find people whose work I really admire and ask them for advice. And then <laughs> I, I find that there's some magic there too and our, our different expertises. And um, yeah, and I'm always inspired by new technology and sometimes people say, hey, Kristen, can you use this? Or can you use this 3D printer? And I'm like, okay, okay, let's see what, see what it can do and um, find someone smarter than myself and, <laughs> and then create something unique and different because I love fusing, fusing the different techniques like organic structure with technology and, um, and the body, yeah. Can you explain how most of those technologies shown in your presentation help the caregiver in more detail? Yeah, so the caregiver often, especially with like the um, sensory processing disorder clientele, um, the caregiver is very attentive, but it's hard to really tell what's going on with the client. Um, and so I was interviewing one caregiver and he said, anything, you know, if I could get any more information, I would be so happy. Um, and so I think like the communication with the caregiver is good, but it also helps build like a nonverbal dialogue between them to have the technology as the, the mediator. Um, And we did another study with autistic children in a school and the, the teacher wore the design with this, the students and it actually helped the students a lot to see other people wearing the design. So I thought that that was very interesting. They're like, oh, she's upset or like, oh, I should pay attention. Um, just having some extra cues, I think helps us all out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, following up on that, it seems like I think a moment ago you said like people don't really know how they feel. And like you, there's sort of in my mind, there's like two steps, right? It's like, okay, realizing you feel something and then being able to name it or verbalize it. So do you have any like what's your experience with people that wear your designs for the first time? Are they like then able to kind of understand how they're feeling? more easily or verbalize it more easily? Yeah, there's always a question. Um, like in one study, they're like, I I turned red, but I didn't think I was feeling excited. And so that made me question like what was really going on. And, um, and so it just creates this new dialogue of like, how am I feeling? And, um, and then, just learning about your body too, because often like blue 
is more calm. Um, but when you're in like a focus zone, like I've had some dancers wear it when they're focused, they're blue. Like when they're totally on in the flow, um, they turn blue. So they're like calm when they're, they're like, oh, I thought I would be excited, but your body's just pretty relaxed at that time. So that's very interesting. Um, and then the, also the neurotique, the brain animating one. And I assumed if people meditated, it would all turn orange, which was like the theta state, but your brain never stops moving. <laughs> so, so that was really interesting to me. I was like, oh, okay. Um, it, it gets faster and slower. And so we started dimming the lights when it, when your brain would calm down. Um, but yeah, I think our bodies are just fascinating. Absolutely. Um, just one final question. Where do you want to go next with your research? What either tools or, you know, parts of the body or topics are you interested in researching? Um, I am interested to create more of the designs so more people could use them. So that's, that's my, my next goal is to be able to test them more remotely. Like if we could add them to a screen scenario, like imagine if we all had some, some mood activity right now um, and really monitor how that changes our experience. I think that's a good next step. Very cool. Remote connection. More remote connection, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your work and being available to answer our questions. We really appreciate you coming to visit us.